In my last video, I told you that I was going to solve a simple Faraday's law problem and a ballistic flight trajectory problem. I'm not quite there yet. I've gotten distracted. A viewer of Dr. Walter Lewin, a professor at MIT, had brought to my attention a problem that he uh, posted. This is his problem number 57 on his website. He posts a bi-weekly physics problem for people to solve. They're rather interesting. And I went to his channel, I looked at it, and I was rather dismayed to see that after six days of this video uh, problem being uh, up, only 120 people or have commented, and I can't see any answers posted. Usually on his problems, there's... Uh, uh, thousands of comments with answers uh, so either people don't know how to solve the a magnetic circuits problem or they've just lost interest I don't know which it is but I, in this video I'm going to show you how to solve magnetic circuits I'm going to show you three different ways I'm going to show you an analytic method a graphical method and an iterative method <clears throat> magnetic circuits are interesting uh, they have an analog in the electrical world is in electric circuits we generally have an electromotive force a voltage source that drives the circuit and you can have uh, resistances that along with the voltage establish what current flows and in a series circuit the current flows uh, continuously through the circuit it's the same value through each elements and we have an analog in magnetic circuits that uh, rather than electromotive force we have what we call a magnetomotive force and rather than resistances in the magnetic world we call it re um, <coughs> a reluctance and uh, the current that flows continuously through an electric circuit it's the flux, the magnetic field lines that flow continuously in a series magnetic circuit. Now, I'm going to show you an approach using Maxwell's equations. Uh, Maxwell's equations are four equations that describe all of electromagnetic phenomena. And the equation that we're particularly interested in is called Ampere's Law. In uh, Maxwell's equations, Ampere's law is stated in this fashion that the curl of H is equal to the partial derivative of the electric flux density D with respect to time these are partial derivatives plus the conduction current density. Now you don't have to know a lot of mathematics. I'm just showing for people that are of interest uh, in Maxwell's equations uh, how this applies to this uh, particular problem. This is a partial of D with respect to time. Okay, now what we do, this is called the point form or the differential form of Ampere's law. We apply Stokes' theorem to this, which takes us um, from a surface integral to a line integral. So first we integrate through this equation uh, with a surface integral. So we take the curl of H, we dot it uh, with a differential area vector and we integrate over some surface that uh, defines the area and we apply this on both sides of the equation so we have partial d with respect to t dotted with the area plus j dot da over that same surface now we apply stokes theorem stokes theorem takes us from an open surface integral into a closed line integral so this right we write this as a closed line integral of h dot dl that's equivalent to that integral is equal to again we just keep this integral the same and the integral 
of current density, J is current density, over a cross-sectional area is just the current. This is called conduction current. This J is has to do with free charge, free charge flowing in a wire or a circuit. So I'll just call this conduction current. Now, the line integral that we choose, the closed line integral, is the perimeter of the surface. In here we have an open sur surface, something like, say like this, where this is our surface. The perimeter of the opening is what defines the perimeter for integrating the path. This is Ampere's law in integral form. Now, this current, this represents a current because if we pull the integral through and we have the partial with respect to time of the integral of the surface at d dot dA, this is charge. D is charge density uh, in the electric world. So d dot dA integrated over the surface just gives us the charge, Q, that's uh, residing in, on, on the surface. So if we take the partial derivative of Q with respect to time, that defines a current. Current is the rate of change of charge. This particular current, the partial of Q with respect to T, this defines a current. This current is called displacement current. So we have two types of current. We have displacement current and we have conduction current. The displacement current is the kind of current that flows, say, between the plates of a capacitor and a dielectric. There, aren't, there isn't any free charge flowing like there is in conduction current. And this is a displacement current. Now, in solving static magnetic field, uh, circuits problems, there is no displacement current. This is a time rate of change, uh, a time varying expression for Ampere's law and in the static condition this goes to zero so we have that the integral of h dot dl or we integrate the, eight, the magnetic field intensity around a closed loop and that's equal to the current enclosed by that path. Well if you have a lot of loops like in an inductor a lot of turns that current flows through then this is nothing more than the summation of the number of turns of the loop times the current. So we call this ampere turns. And <clears throat> H dot DL is we, uh, every part of the circuit, if H changes over different uh, sections, we take that value, multiply by the path length that uh, the H is present in in that particular section and we sum all these up and that's equal to the current enclosed. Now what that looks like is something like this. Say you have a um, uh, some sort of a magnetic circuit. <clears throat> magnetic circuit is like a transformer or <coughs> an actuator relay something like that. <clears throat> so, if we have, um, say, a magnetic core, this could be like a steel rod bent into a shape where we have an air gap in there, and we wind some turns around it, and we shove a current through that end turn coil. This is our ampere turns. N times I is equal to the H field, which would be in this direction, our H. So in the core, we can call that H core, and then in the gap, we can call this H gap. And this would be the length of our gap. And then around the center of this core, that path length, we can call that length of the core. So 
or ampere turns is going to be equal to the H field in the core times the length of the core plus the H field in the gap plus the length times the length of the gap. So this is our magnetic circuit equation. This is analogous to um, using Kirchhoff's voltage law in electrical analog, except there's a difference here. Is in amp in Kirchhoff's voltage law, you have E dot DL is equal to zero. This is a conservative force field where we can write Kirchhoff's voltage law where we have the sum of voltages around a loop is equal to zero. That's not quite the same. We don't have a conservative system in the magnetic analog. The Ni turns are called the magneto, magnetomotive force and here are the voltage drops in a sense on each element. This is not equal to zero. This is more of a Faraday's law expression where we have a non-conservative force field. So the sums of the drops of the magnetomotive forces on each of the sections don't sum to zero like they do for Kirchhoff's voltage law in the electrical anal uh, networks, but is equal to the magnetomotive force that's induced into the uh, magnetic circuit by uh, some ampere turns. So that's the difference. Now, we're going to use Ampere's law for static fields, which is this, is that um, the Ni, the summation of all the ampere turns in the magnetic network is equal to the sum of the HL sections in the magnetic network. <coughs> we could have more than one coil with um, ampere turns. We could have several of them. We could have another one with, say, turns N1, we have a current I1. We could put another one here. This would be N2 with current I2. So the magnetomotive force on this left side is the sum of all the ampere turns. But in the circuit we're going to deal with, we have only one coil with one current, so it makes it much simpler. But if you had multiple coils with different currents, you have to add all of them up in aiding and opposing fluxes to get the total magnetomotive force that is exciting the magnetic. Here we have a diagram of a simple magnetic circuit. This is a series magnetic circuit. What we have is a what we call core, a core material. This could be a magnetic material, ferromagnetic material like steel or cast iron, uh, sheet steel, uh, or an iron rod, anything like that that a magnet will stick to. It. It's ferromagnetic material. And for simplicity, we'll assume that the cross-sectional area, this is a um, uh, square stock of steel bent in a C like this, <clears throat> and we have a gap <clears throat> between the ends. The length of the gap is small LG, LG, and the cross-sectional area of the gap, this area in here, will be AG, and <clears throat> in this core material, being square stock, we have a cross-sectional area, and we'll call that A of the core, the cross-sectional area. This is the area that the flux passes through. We have a uh, coil wrapped around the steel core and we insert a current flow in this coil of N terms. So we have N I <coughs> ampere turns flowing in this coil. Number of turns times the current flowing in each term. We call this ampere turns. Amps being the current and the number of turns in. This is our magnetomotive force. This establishes 
a flux flowing in the core, a magnetic flux. And the direction of the flux is given by the right hand rule. If the current flows through the coil in this direction, it establishes a magnetic field uh, curled around the wire in the direction of your fingers of the right hand. So that means then this green, which would be our magnetic flux lines, are flowing in a clockwise direction with the coil wrapped in this orientation with a current flowing into the wire, a positive current flowing in. And this flux flows through the core and the air gap. Now the key point here is that in a series magnetic circuit, the flux is continuous throughout, just like current in an electrical circuit is continuous throughout a series network. So, the flux in the gap is going to be equal to the magnetic flux in the core. Those are equal this in a series magnetic circuit. Now, <clears throat> we use Ampere's law that the number of ampere turns, the magnetomotive force, is equal to the H in the core times the length of the core plus the H in the gap times the length of the gap. This is Ampere's law that we just talked about. That the uh, ampere turns or magnetomotive force around a magnetic circuit is equal to the sum of the products of the magnetic field intensity times the length of the segment that that particular uh, field has uh, a constant value in. So we sum up all these different sections uh, in a series magnetic circuit. So this is the key equation, Ampere's Law. We'll be using this equation uh, for setting up our um, uh, equations for solving the magnetic circuit. Now, in general, the magnetic core materials are nonlinear. They look something like this. If I plot H on the horizontal axis and the B field, the magnetic flux intense, uh, uh, density on the vertical axis, the relationship is nonlinear. This is called a BH curve. And B is related to H through a parameter called the permeability, mu. So B is equal to mu H. But for ferromagnetic materials, mu is a function of H also. It's not a constant. If mu is a constant, then our BH curve would be a straight line, like this, where mu never changes. It would have a value a slope of uh, mu, which would always be the same. It'd be constant, but in general, magnetic materials are not linear. They're very nonlinear, which makes a solving a problem like this in general um, much more difficult than solving electrical networks, because in electrical networks, we invoke Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a linear relationship between voltage, resistance, and current. That's a linear relationship. And if I were to plot voltage versus current, we would get a straight line and the slope um, <clears throat> would be the resistance. However, we can see in a magnetic network in that such a relationship does not exist. We have B equals mu H, but mu is a function of H. Whereas in electrical networks, R is not a function of the current. So this is a constant, and uh, Ohm's law is a linear relationship. So we have to take this into consideration in general, is how to handle a nonlinear problem. Now, in Professor Lewin's problem, he basically posed a problem like this. He gave the value for the uh, air gap. He assumed that the area of the cross-sectional area of the gap and the core were identical, um, that the uh, length of the gap was two and a half millimeters, uh, the number of turns is 130, the current flowing into 130 terms is 15 amps, 
and he made the problem very easy for you because he assumed he gave you the value of mu in the core. He told you that value. Now in general you won't know that value. You have to determine it from the nonlinear characteristic and knowing the mag magnetomotive force that's being applied to the network uh, to determine mu. But he made it very easy for you. He told you what the mu in the core is so that makes it very simple in solving this problem. We can solve it analytically if we know what the permeability of the core is and I'll show you that right now how this is solved analytically given the value of mu. Now the magnetic circuit that Professor Lewin gave rather than made of square stock in a bent into a rectangular shape he gave it as a round uh, rod and bent into a nice continuous ring that has a radius cap R <coughs> is a we call that the mean radius when that whenever you bend something in a circular form you have two radiuses you have an inner radius and an outer radius and you average them when solving magnetic circuits and this is called the mean path length so our capital R that is given is eight centimeters <coughs> The cross-sectional area of both the core and the gap is given as 5 square centimeters or 5 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters. We have 130 of these turns wrapped around with a current of 15 amperes flowing through 130 turns. So our Ni ampere turns is 130 times 15 which is 1950 ampere turns. Okay a few relationships that we need to know is B is related to H through the permeability mu and like I said in general mu is not a constant. Mu can be related to the free space value we call the free space value of mu mu zero and mu zero is a constant. It is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th Henry's per meter. This is exact, not approximate. So mu is the free space value times a correction factor or a figure of merit called the relative permeability, mu sub r. Professor Lewin gives this as 2500. Now I'll call it mu r the relative permeability in the core, mu RC, is 2500. It's a unitless number. Now, the flux in the core is related to the magnetic flux density times the area. So B times the area gives us flux. Now we start with Ampere's Law. That we had before. The magnetomotive force, Ni, is equal to the H field in the gap times the length of the gap plus the H field in the core times the length of the core. And we have a continuous or we have a series magnetic circuit so the fluxes are continuous. Whatever flux flows in the core jumps through the air gap with the same value. The same amount of flux appears in the gap as appears in the core. <clears throat> What tends to happen in real life, though, is if you widen the gap too much, you get what's called fringing fields. The field, rather than going continuously across in a nice laminar type flow, starts to fringe as you widen the gap. And so you can't make the assumption then, if you open up the gap too wide, that the field is going to be uniform. The same amount of flex lines flow in the gap as was in the core, but they kind of go like this. And they fringe out so you have a non-uniform magnetic field. We are going to assume that the gap is narrow enough where the field will be uniform going across the gap. 
just like it would be here. We have a uniform flux field going across the gap. That's one assumption that we make here. So the flux in the gap is equal to the flux in the core. We make use of this relationship then. The flux in the gap is the B field in the gap times the area of the gap is equal to the B field in the core times the area of the core. We have a relationship of B with H. So we substitute in for B. B is mu H. So we've got H in the gap times the mu of the gap times the area of the gap is equal to the H in the core times the mu of the core times the area of the core. Now in the gap, we have air. So the mu in the gap is just mu zero, the free space value of the permeability. And in the core, the permeability of the core is mu RC times the free space value given by this relationship. So then we can write substituting or solving for HC in this equation. HC is equal to HG mu of the gap, which is mu zero, area of the gap divided by mu C AC. <coughs> now, this relates the H field in the core to the H field in the gap. We now go and substitute this in to our Ampere's Law equation for HC. We put HC over in there. So I will now write this in for HC. Remember, we've got HCLC, so if I multiply by LC, this is our LCHC here. So we write this as HG mu zero A in the gap length of the core times the permeability in the core times the area in the core. So that's our Ampere Law's equation. <clears throat> now, we can factor out H in the gap here. So we've got H in the gap is the length of the gap plus mu zero, area of the gap, length of the core, divided by the permeability of the core, divided by the area of the core. Now, let's sub solve for H in the gap. So H in the gap then is Ni divided by this expression, which is the length of the gap plus free space value of the permeability times the area of the gap, length of the core divided by the permeability in the core times the area of the core. Okay. So, here is a key equation for us. <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is multiply numerator and denominator by mu C A C. So then, This then becomes Ni mu C A C all over Lg mu C A C plus mu zero A in the gap length of the core. Okay, now <clears throat> let's um Let's go ahead and uh, the, make our substitution here. We know that for this particular problem, that the area of the core is equal to the area of the gap. So we can simplify this equation. AC and AG are the same. So A, the areas appear in every term, so they cancel out. So we can rewrite this in this fashion now. We can write that our HG the H, in, H field in the gap then is Ni 
times the permeability of the core divided by the gap length times the permeability of the core plus free space value of mu zero times the length of the core. <clears throat> now, remember that the permeability of the core can be written in this fashion, mu rc times mu zero, and we have the same thing here, mu c is mu rc mu zero plus mu zero lc. So we have a mu zero in each term, and we can cancel those out. So the H field in the gap then can be written as Ni mu RC over the length of the gap times mu RC plus the length of the core. So there's our basic equation for this particular problem that relates the <clears throat> H field in the gap to the magnetomotive force and the parameters that describe the circuit. That is the length of the gap, the length of the core, and the relative permeability in the core. Now, we're given everything. We know Ni, it's 1950. We know mu RC, which is 2500. We've got the length of the gap, which is, um, <clears throat> in this case, uh, what was given was two and a half millimeters. Length of the gap is 2.5 millimeters. And given the radius, we can compute the mean path length for the length of the core. <clears throat> so we put the numbers in. So we have Ni is 1950, mu RC is 2500, length of the gap <clears throat> in terms of meters, we have to have it in terms of meters, so it's 0 0.0025, and then we multiply that by 2500, which is mu RC, <clears throat> and then we add to it the length of the core, the mean path length of the core. Well, LC, since it's a circular path, is going to be 2 pi times the radius, cap R, minus the length of the gap. <clears throat> so if we put the numbers in, you can check this out, is 2 pi R, where R is 8 centimeters, or 8 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, this number comes out to <coughs> 0 0.50015 meters. That is LC. So we put that in here, 0 0.50015. So we can get our value for the H field in the gap. HG then, cranking this out, comes to 722,206 ampere turns per meter. That's what that comes out to. Now, since the B field in the gap is the permeability of the gap, which is the free space value mu zero times the H field, this is four pi 10 to the minus seventh times 7.222 times 10 to the fifth. And if you multiply this out, four pi is uh, a little more than 12 times 7.222, 12 times uh, seven <coughs> um, is um, uh, 84, uh, so this is going to come out to the number BG, if you crank this out, you get 0 0.90755 Teslas. Tesla is the unit for 
magnetic field uh, or magnetic flux density. This is a Tesla. <sighs> or a Weber per square meter is a Tesla. So that's the answer. The B field in the gap is almost one Tesla. It's 0 0.90755 Tesla. You can get the flux. If you want to know what the flux is, the flux will just be just BG times the area of the gap. And the area is 5 times 10 to the minus 4th. So if we multiply um, this number by 5 times 10 to the minus 4th, we'll get about uh, 4 and a half uh, times 10 to the minus 4th, uh, so it would be about 450 uh, microwebers um, for, for that particular answer. So if we put in for here, we've got B in the gap, which is 0 0.9, and then area of the gap is 5 times 10 to the minus 4th. This comes out to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4th, or 450 microwebers is what the flux would be uh, in the gap. <clears throat> now, note here that our B field in the gap and the H field in the gap are independent of the uh, path cross section because we um, the, it, it doesn't appear into the, in the expressions at all uh, the area, the cross-sectional area, has not appeared in the expression because we force the cross-sectional area of the gap and the core to be the same, so the area drops out of the equation uh, because they have the same cross-section. If you look at our expression, um, <clears throat> right here, is um, our H field is just Ni times the relative permeability over the length of the gap times relative permeability times the length of the core. Area does not appear in the, um, the section. Now, if we look at this a little more carefully, <clears throat> let's rewrite this equation right here. in the following manner. I'm going to divide through by the relative permeability. So this becomes Ni over Lg plus Lc over mu Rc. Now for good magnetic materials the relative permeability is much much greater than 1. In this case it was 2500. So for any finite path length of uh, a, a core material, as mu RC gets very, very large, this becomes very small compared to the gap. That basically goes to zero as our core material gets more and more ideal, which tells us then that most of the ampere turns, the magnetomotive force that's exciting the circuit, it all gets dropped in the gap. If you open up the material at all, most of the magnetomotive force gets dropped in the gap. This is analogous to electrical circuits that an air gap has a large reluctance compared to the core. That's like talking about putting a large resistor in series with a smaller resistor. The core would be a small resistance, the gap would be a very large resistance, so all of the voltage driving a circuit, say call this R core, this is R of the gap, and we have some magnetomotive force, this is a series circuit, if R gap is much, much larger than RC uh, of the core, most of this magnetomotive force is dropped across the gap. This is just a series uh, divider network where 
the magnetomotive force, call this magnetomotive force in the gap, will just be RG over RG plus RC. And if RG is much greater than RC, this number almost becomes equal to 1. This is times magnetomotive force. So the amount of magnetomotive force dropped in the gap is nearly equal to the magnetomotive force that's driving the network because this expression here is nearly equal to 1 when RG is much greater than RC. Now I'm going to talk about the iterative solution for solving magnetic circuits problems where we have nonlinear uh, core material. Typically the core material used in magnetic circuits are ferromagnetics that have very nonlinear relationships between the magnetic flux density B and the magnetic intensity H. We see that there is a nonlinear relationship between them. The BH relationship is generally presented in a graph called the BH curve. Uh, for any type of magnetic materials you purchase, you can get the BH curve for that material that tells you the relationship between uh, the magnetic field intensity and the magnetic flux density. Now, here are two BH curves. This is representative of what is sheet steel, the green curve, and the blue curve is representative of cast iron. The nature of BH curves are such that a magnetic material will saturate if you impart too large of a magnetomotive force or the ampere turns to excite the material. It eventually top out and saturate. This region is called the saturation region and we can reverse the direction of the current so that the curves become symmetrical. Here we have positive H, here we have negative H. That just has to do with the direction of the current going through the coil that excites the uh, core material. So it's going to be a symmetric curve. In this region here, we call this the linear region. Here the permeability remains fairly constant regardless of the value of H that uh, is inside the material. And then it'll start topping out and saturating if you increase the H beyond the uh, linear region. For sheet steel, the saturation tends to be upwards of about one and a half Teslas, 1.4 Teslas. And for cast iron, it's much lower. It's about 0.4 Teslas. And you can have a whole variety of ferromagnetic materials in here. Sometimes these curves can be rather steep or rather shallow in this fashion. Depends on the nature of the ferromagnetic material. Now, when we look at these curves, these are called a normalized BH curve. What actually happens is if you start out with say magnetic material where the domains are all random and has no magnetization and you start increasing the ampere turns what you do is you take say your material you wrap a coil around it and you shove a current in that coil as you increase the I you're increasing the H field in the material and the B field will start increasing <clears throat> but when you bring it up to a value, say some H value, and you back down, it doesn't follow the curve. It actually comes back in this manner. And then when the H is reduced to zero, there is some residual magnetization in B field in the material. It becomes a permanent magnet. It's like you ran, wind a coil around a nail uh, to make an electromagnet. If the nail was initially unmagnetized, if you shove a current through a coil and then um, uh, reduce the current to zero, that magnetic material or that steel will uh, become a permanent magnet. It will retain some of the field. We call this <coughs> a permanent magnetization when the H field has been reduced to zero and there's a 
um, residual magnetic field in there, the domains, magnetic domains become aligned to create a permanent magnet. We call this the retent, uh, retentivity of the material. You reduce the excitation to zero and there's a permanent magnet, uh, some residual field left over. That's the retentivity uh, of, re of the material. Now, if you reverse the current flow to destroy the permanent magnet, then when the H gets to a uh, certain value there, we call this the coercitivity. The coercitivity of the material is that amount of the H field that um, <clears throat> is needed to, for the material to surrender its magnetization, to destroy the magnetization. It's a measure of the ability of a ferromagnetic material to withstand an external magnetic field without becoming magnetized. So we have two important points. We have the retentivity, the residual magnetization after you remove the excitation, the domains become aligned, we get a permanent magnet, and then the amount of uh, uh, reverse uh, H field to drive the magnetization to zero, which is called the coercitivity. Now, if we continue going in the negative direction, our magnetic field will follow this, and then if we reverse and go back in the positive, it goes up like this. It has what we call a property, it's called hysteresis. That is, the, um, the magnetization or the B field remembers its past as well as its present value. Uh, ferromagnetic materials exhibit this effect called hysteresis. Our B field is not single valued for any given H. So if we select an H, we have two values. It's not single valued. <clears throat> the, um, the B field rather is, depends not only on the present values of the H, but also on values from earlier times. So if we say, go around this hysteresis loop, and if we decrease the um, magnetization down to zero and start again and come up a little further away, what we end up were smaller hysteresis loops like this. And if we trace out the endpoints of the hysteresis loops, this gives us the normalized magnetization curve uh, or the BH curve. Now, the area inside the hysteresis loop represents losses, heating losses in the core material. It's an undesirable effect of hysteresis. It's a loss of energy uh, in conversion to heat uh, as you cycle the magnetic material around uh, its hysteresis loop. This is what causes heating in transformers is uh, as you cycle a transformer with an alternating current, you're going around this hysteresis loop and you have heating losses uh, due to the hysteresis. Now your better magnetic materials for like transformer cores have a very thin uh, hysteresis loop. It'll, it'll be very, very thin, so there's very little loss. A thin hysteresis loop represents small losses and a very fat hysteresis loop represents a lot of losses. This is a characteristic, you'd use something with a fat loop if you want to create like a memory cell. Something that will, this is the type of material they used to use for core memories where uh, you'd re maintain a, uh, a, a large retentivity and it wouldn't flip until you 
uh, drove a current in the opposite direction to cause the magnetic field to flip so your coercitivity would be down in the reverse direction. This would create a bit, a zero and a one. A um, magnetic field in one direction would represent a one, a magnetic field in the other direction would represent a zero. So uh, you'd choose a material with a real fat hysteresis loop for uh, that sort of a function. <coughs> Now, now we're going to use the uh, BH curve I just showed you to show you how to solve a nonlinear magnetic circuit through iteration. Okay, now we're going to use iteration to find the magnetic field in the gap, the B field in the gap. We designate it as BG in the air gap here. Now, from Ampere's law, we know that the ampere turns, the magnetomotive force, is equal to the H in the core times the length of the core plus the H field in the gap times the length of the gap. I will designate LC, LC, HCLC as the ampere turns in the core and HGLG is the ampere turns in the gap. From Ampere's law you will remember that H dot DL is equal to the ampere turns so this is just H L H1 L1 plus H2 L2 so on is equal to the ampere turns so they have the same units H L is the same units as ampere turns so the portion of the ampere turns that can be related to the core I'll call NIC and the amount of ampere turns that could be related to the gap, I'll call it Ni of the gap. So in the iterative solution, what we do is we first make a guess, a wild guess, as to how much of the magnetomotive force, the total Ni, which is we have a coil of N terms and we're putting a current I through it, how much of that Ni is dropped in the gap and how much is dropped in the core. So what I'm going to do is we, we make this guess, then from the ampere turns in the core, we compute the HC, and then we go to the graph. This is, will be our graph of uh, the core material. So once we know, given the amount of ampere turns that we're going to allocate to the core, we compute what the corresponding H field is, we go to the graph, find that value of H, and then go off up to the graph, the curve, and read what the B field would be. And then once we know the B field, we can, multi um, we can multiply by the area to get the flux. But then what we also do then is take the amount of ampere turns we've allocated to the gap, compute the H field in the gap, and then from the permeability of the gap, we know what that is. That's always going to be the free space value, mu zero, which is four pi times 10 to the minus seventh. That's constant. That never changes regardless of how large or how small the H field is. So we compute the B field in the gap. We compare it to the B field in the core. If they match, we're done. Because remember, the flux is continuous throughout the circuit but since we've chosen the area of the gap to equal the area of the core, the flux being continuous throughout is the same as the B field being continuous throughout because uh, they're related through the area. And if the areas of the gap and the core are the same, the B field uh, equal fluxes, continuous flux also uh, demands that the B field be continuous. So, after we've made our guesses and we compute BC and BG, we compare them. If they're the same, we're done. We've solved the network. If they aren't the same, we have to readjust the amount of ampere turns allocated to the core and the gap and go through the procedure again, compare the B fields or the fluxes and see if they match. And we keep going through this iterative process. We keep improving our guesses until we get the B fields to match or the fluxes to match uh, in this core, uh, case. So once we get them to match, then we're done. So let's go through uh, the uh, procedure and um, 
uh, see how we do this. <clears throat> now, let's consider our circuit here. We know that the ampere turns is 1950. We've already determined that. That's the amount of ampere turns. That's 130 turns times 15 amps. Now let's start with a guess. We're going to guess that the Ni of the core, which is H in the core times the L of the core, let's just take a guess and say that this is 200 ampere turns. Then the Ni of the gap is the H of the gap times the L of the gap, which would be 1900 minus the core, because we have the core and ampere turns plus the gap ampere turns is equal to 1950. So this will be 1950 minus 200, which is 1750 ampere turns for the gap. <clears throat> now, we can solve for HC here. HC um, <clears throat> will be uh, 200 divided by the length of the core. Well, we know the length of the core is a half a meter from before. The um, length of the core was 0 0.50015 meters. I'm going to neglect the um, uh, 15 here. Uh, <clears throat> it's very close to a half. We'll call it a half. <coughs> and the length of the gap, if you remember, is 2.5 millimeters or um, 0 0.0025 meters. So if we put a half in here, we've got 200 divided by 0.5, or this is 400 ampere turns per meter. That's the H in the core. So we come over to our graph. We go here. We've got five, 400 for the H field. We move on up and we read that the B field in the core is 1.2 Teslas. So this tells us that the B in the core is 1.2 Teslas. Now, how about the gap? For the gap, we have HGLG is 1750. So H in the gap will be 1750 ampere turns divided by the length of the gap, which is 0 0.0025. And <clears throat> if we uh, divide this through, this is 7.0 times 10 to the fifth <clears throat> ampere turns per meter. Very large H field. Now, Let's compute the B field for the gap. We know what the B field in the core is. It's 1.2 Tesla that we read off the graph. Well, the B field in the gap <clears throat> is just H in the gap times the permeability of the gap, which is mu zero. So this is seven times 10 to the fifth times four pi times 10 to the minus 7. And if we uh, compute that out, this comes out to 0 0.8796 Teslas. Well, now we compare the B field and the gap and the B field and the core. They're not equal. It, they must be equal for us to have a solution. So we have to readjust our guesses for the ampere turns being allocated between the gap and the core. So for our second guess, we can see that we need to reduce the ampere turns in the core because the B field is much larger than it is in the gap. So we need to increase the ampere turns in the gap and reduce it in the core. So now we need to make a new guess in the allocation of our ampere turns. We started with the ampere turns in the core at 200 ampere turns. Let's decrease it to 100. Let's decrease it by 100. So we're now going to guess that the ampere turns in the core are 100. So we're increasing the ampere turns in the gap by 100. The sum of these two must be 1950. That's our magnetomotive force. 
Okay, now, given those two new values, we first look at the core. The H in the core will be 100 divided by the length of the core, which is a half. So 100 divided by a half is 200 ampere terms per meter. And in the gap, our H in the gap will be 1850 divided by the length of the gap, which is 0 0 0.0025. And so the H in the gap now becomes 7.4 times 10 to the fifth. Now, the B field in the gap, which we need to know to compare it to the B field in the core, is just mu zero times Hg, which is four pi 10 to the minus seventh times 7.4 times 10 to the fifth. So our gap, uh, B field then, in this case, is 0 0.93 Tesla, multiplying those two out. How about the core? Well, the core, the H in the core is 200. So that puts us over here for our second guess. So we go to 200 and the H, we go up to the curve and read the B field. The B field in this case is 0.4 for the core. So B in the core is 0.4 Teslas. Well, let's compare. We need the B in the core and the B in the gap to be the same. They're not the same. Now, the core B field has dropped way below the gap, whereas before it was higher. So now we have to adjust. We need to increase the amount of ampere turns in the core and decrease them in the gap slightly. We, we changed by 100. This time, let's change by 50. Let's increase the ampere turns in the core by uh, 50, which makes the ampere turns 150 and decrease by 150 on the gap. Now let's look at how that goes. Now, we're making an adjustment uh, by 50 ampere turns. Is we're going to increase the amount of ampere turns allocated to the core by uh, 50 more than the previous guess, so we're at 150 on the core, and in the gap, it will be 1950, our NI turns, the magnetomotive force, less 150 or 1800. These two must sum to give us the NI of 1950. So, in the core, our H field then, will be 150 divided by the length of the core, and remember the length of the core is a half, so 150 divided by half is 300. <clears throat> and this is ampere turns per meter. And in the gap, our H field will be 1800 divided by the length of the gap, which is two and a half millimeters or 0 0.0025 meters. So we have 7.2 times 10 to the fifth ampere turns per meter in the gap. The B field in the gap is just the permeability of the gap, which is our mu zero times the ampere um, <clears throat> or the H field. So 4 pi 10 to the minus 7 times 7.2 times 10 to the fifth. This comes out to the B field in the gap is 0 0.905 Teslas. How about the B field in the core? Well, the B field in the core is we got to take our ampere turns in the core, which is 300. So our third guess now, we go to 300. We move up and we see that the um, uh, B field then in the core, according to the uh, BH curve, <coughs> is I'm reading off 0.96, 0 0.96 Tesla. Comparing them, we're getting very close now. They're almost, they're, they're, they're starting to converge together. So what this tells us here is the B field is slightly greater in the core than it is a gap, so we have to slightly reduce the ampere turns in the core. And I'm going to reduce it by a factor of 10. So now our LCHC is going to be 140 ampere turns. And our L gap, H gap will increase 
by 10 ampere turns. Remember that uh, um, these two numbers, when summed together, got to equal the total ampere turns magnetomotive force. So 140 plus 1810 is 1950, which it has to be. So computing the H field in the core, it's 140 divided by the length of the core is a half, so this is 280. And the H in the gap will be 1810 divided by the length of the gap, 00, 0.0025. And that number <clears throat> comes to 7.24 times 10 to the fifth. Now, the B field in the gap is mu zero times H in the gap. Mu zero is four pi times 10 to the minus seventh. So in the gap, taking mu zero times this number, we get 0 0.91 Teslas. How about in the core? Well, with the core, we gotta use the H field in the core and go to our BH curve. So H in the core is 280, so our fourth try here, we go to 280, and we go on up, and I read uh, 0 0.91. So B field in the core is 0 0.91 Tesla. They agree, so we're done. We've solved the operating point of the magnetic core. Now. This is the same value that we had before when I computed analytically uh, Lewin's problem. The reason for that is I happened to choose a BH curve where in the linear region the permeability, the relative permeability is 2500 just like Professor Lewin chose. So as long as the relative permeability is 2500 going through the operating point that Lewin chose for his problem, the iterative method is going to agree with the analytical uh, calculation that we did earlier. So we, we have confidence that the iterative technique worked. Now, let's try the iterative technique. I'll show you how to do a bookkeeping method to make it go easier, not quite so messy here. Let's increase the width of the gap Let's double it. Rather than having the gap being two and a half millimeters, let's make it five millimeters and see what we end up with for an operating point, what the B field is inside the gap when we've doubled the gap width. We've now increased the length of the air gap by a factor of two to five millimeters. Here's our magnetic circuit. We have a magnetic core material and the radius of this uh, C is 8 centimeters as before. We have 130 turns of wire wrapped around this core and we're pushing a current of 15 amps in there. So we have a total magnetomotive force that excites the network, this magnetic circuit the total ampere turns is 1950, 1950 ampere turns. The length of the gap is 0 0.005 meters. The length of the core is 2 pi times the radius of mean radius of the core minus the length of the gap. And that works out to 0.49765 meters. And again, we're holding the cross sectional area of the gap and the core to be the same at five square centimeters or five times 10 to the minus fourth meters. Okay, here's our relationships. We allocate, again, we're gonna do an iterative technique. We allocate, we have a certain number of ampere turns. We have a total number of ampere turns, Ni, and that's gonna be equal, split between the core, the amount of ampere turns in the core, plus the number of ampere turns in the gap. These two sum to 1950. <clears throat> so that's what we have here. The number of ampere turns in the core divided by the length of the core gives us the H field in the core. So this is 
uh, ampere turns in the core, divide by the length of the core, which is 0.4976, and the H field and the gap are the ampere turns allocated to the gap, divide by the length of the gap, or the Ni turns, ampere turns in the gap, divide by 0 0.005 meters. Okay, now, once we get our H fields in the core in the gap, we get the B field in the core by reading it from the BH curves. We have a certain amount of H field in the core. We find that on the graph. We move up to the BH curve and read what the magnetic flux density is, the B field. And in the gap, we don't have to do that because a gap is always has a linear relationship between the H field and the B field by the permeability of free space, which is mu zero, four pi times 10 to the minus seventh. So the B field in the gap is four pi times 10 to the minus seventh times the H field. Now, to make it easy, we have a bookkeeping method. We create a table and we have various columns here. We have the ampere turns of the core, ampere turns of the gap. The sum of these two is going to be 1950. So we have the freedom to choose how many of the ampere turns we allocate to the core and how many we allocate to the gap. Then once we have those, we compute the H field in the core. And from the H field in the core, we go to the BH curve, find the B in the core, and then by the area, if we multiply B field in the core by the area of the core, we can get the flux in the core. I'm expressing flux as 10 to the minus flux times 10 to the minus fourth to make the uh, number easier to uh, write. And in the gap, the H field in the gap here will be the H field times 10 to the fourth. And we get that from this equation, the ampere turns in the gap divided by the length of the gap, which is 0 0.005 meters. And then from this expression, we can get the B field in the gap. And then if we multiply the gap by the gap area, cross-sectional area, we can get the flux in the gap. Now, in general, when the cross-sectional areas of the gap and the core are not the same, we need to look for continuous flux. Remember, the flux in a series circuit, magnetic circuit, is continuous. The flux is continuous. The flux is going to be the same in the gap as in the core, neglecting fringing. We're assuming there isn't any, aren't any fringing fields. So the flux are going to be the same. Now, because we have a special case where the area, cross-sectional area of the core and the gap are the same, we can also equate the B fields. The B fields are going to be the same because the B field, the flux in the gap is going to equal the flux in the core. So this will be B in the gap times area of the gap equals B in the core times the area in the core. This is what we're looking to be continuous across the boundaries from the core into the gap. But since the area of the gap and the area of the core are the same, the B fields are also going to be the same. So in general, you're going to be looking to equate the fluxes rather than the B fields. But just because we have the same areas for the core as the gap, we can also look for the same B fields. So we start. We take a guess. We allocate our ampere turns, a certain amount to the core and a certain amount to the gap. So I'm going to allocate on my first guess I'm going to allocate 250 ampere turns to the core and 1700 to the gap. We know that the gap drops most of the ampere turns from before. So that's how I'm going to allocate. Now, I'm not going to do all the computations. You can go and check my computations. But in this case, if we put 250 divided by 0.4976, we get 502 for the H field in the core. We go here, 502, we read off the uh, curve, and we get 1.30 teslas. And multiplying this by the area, 
which is 5 times 10 to the minus fourth, and express our flux times 10 to the minus fourth, this comes out to 6.5. Now, in the gap, <coughs> we have 1,700 ampere turns. We divide by 0 0.005 meters, and the H field times 10 to the fourth is 34.0. The B field in the gap is this times mu zero, or four pi times 10 to the minus seventh, and that comes out to 0 0.427, and the flux times 10 to the minus fourth is 2.136. So what we're gonna do is compare the fluxes. They are widely different. There's much more flux in the core than in the gap, and the B fields also are, are going to be differ by the same ratio. So, we're not done. Uh, our gas produced a lot higher flux in B field in the core than in the gap. So now we need to reduce the amount of ampere turns in the core to lower this number and increase by the same amount on the gap to raise this number. So, on our second guess, let's reduce the ampere turns of the core to 100. And for the gap, it'll be 1950 less than 100 or 1850 ampere turns. Okay, the H field in the core, it's 100 divided by this number, and that comes out to 201. So we take 201, we go over to our graph, and we read up, and I read 0.42 for the B field on the BH curve. Then we multiply by the area. <clears throat> In the area we get 2.10 <coughs> for our flux in the core. Now for the gap, we take our ampere turns divided by the length of the gap and the H field here will be 37.0 times 10 to the fourth. The B field, we multiply this number by mu zero, and this comes out to 0 0.465, and the flux comes out to 2.36. We compare the fluxes, now they're getting cl closer together. The gap has a little more flux in B field than the core, so we need to reduce the ampere turns in the gap to lower this number and raise this number. So let's guess, let's go to 120 for the ampere turns in the core and 1950 less 120 is 1830 for the ampere turns in the gap. Okay, again, the H field in the core is this number divided by the length of the core. So this comes out to 241. We take 241, we go over to our graph of the BH curve for the core, and we read up, and I see 0 0.63, 0 0.63 for the B field in the core. Multiplying that by the area to get the flux, we get 3.15 times 10 to the minus fourth. Now for the gap, we take our 1830 divided by 0 0.005 for the length of the gap. <coughs> and we get 36.6 times 10 to the fourth for our H field. The B field is mu zero times this number, which is 0 0.460. And multiply by the area of the gap, we get 2.30. Now, let's compare our um, <clears throat> our fluxes. Well, we can see that before we were pretty close, but now we're starting to spread apart again. So we've allocated too much ampere turns to the core. The core uh, flux has increased dramatically because of the nonlinearity of the curve. So Let's go in between, let's estimate, we, we jumped up, um, we've got a difference here of about two-thirds. 
and so two thirds of 20 uh, <clears throat> gives us about uh, 1415. So let's just increase the core by a hunt by five. So we have the ampere turns in the core is 105, and in the gap 1845, computing the H field in the core, we get 211. We take 211, we go over to the graph and read, and in the graph I read 0.483, so 0.483 for the B field, the corresponding flux, multiplying this number by the area is 2.42. Now in the gap, we take our 1845 divided by the gap length of 0 0.005, and we get 30. 6.9 times 10 to the fourth for the H field multiplied by mu zero, we get 0 0.464 for uh, Teslas for the uh, gap B field and multiplying by the area, we get 2.32. Let's now compare and we can see that these now are getting pretty darn close together. So another iteration would tell us that since the gap has a B field slightly less than the core on this iteration, we need to reduce the ampere turns on the core and increase on the gap. So probably for our next guess, it's going to be somewhere between um, 100 and 105. We see we were pretty close here where the core was uh, less than the gap and now the core here is greater than the gap so it's going to be somewhere between 100 and 105 for ampere turns on the core so I think on this guess I would probably go halfway between maybe try 102 and see where we're at so if I chose 103 let's see if I chose 103 then what we find uh, <coughs> is that the um, um, uh, it'll, it'll almost be right on. So um, that that's how you do the iterative technique. Build yourself a table so that you can keep track of the guesses that you make on allocating the ampere turns between the core and the gap, and uh, you'll eventually converge to the right answer. And again, we're getting to um, a point now here, remember that our B field when the gap, being the gap, when the gap was two and a half millimeters, we had 0 0.91 Teslas. This time we've widened the gap by a factor of two. So the B field at five millimeters is giving us uh, about 0 0.48, 0 0.48. So our, um, we've almost reduced the B field by a factor of two when we've uh, increased the gap by a, a factor of two, which is telling us if we look at this at 211 for our H, we're still in the linear region, see? So we would expect in the linear region things to behave proportionately. As long as we're in the linear region, if we increase or decrease a gap by a factor of k, the B field will increase or decrease by a factor of k. But if we change the gap, increase the gap beyond, uh, say, 5 millimeters, we're going to be start getting in this portion of the curve, so it's not going to change proportionately uh, like it did when we're in the linear region. And I'll show that now in uh, a graphical method.